Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Anya Hurlbert, Dean of Advancement and Professor of Visual Neuroscience at Newcastle University. It's wonderful to connect with so many alumni from all around the world in this year's Alumni Day of Action. And we're delighted that the flood of support and ideas from across our community has made the day become a month of action. This year's theme is social justice, and we begin the program of activity exploring the topic of poverty, welfare, and social class. Food poverty is the inability to get enough nutritious food because of not having enough money or not having easy access. It is a global problem, but much more common in the UK than you would think. Food problem, poverty also became a bigger problem during the pandemic, of course. Tonight, our three illuminating speakers from the Newcastle University community, from our staff and alumni, will unravel the myths regarding food poverty, tell us real life stories of people accessing food banks, and explain how food banks go beyond the provision of food. Our three pioneers in understanding and tackling food poverty all started in Newcastle one way or another, and they have exciting stories, ventures, and promise. They also give real substantial help to people. We're welcoming Dr. Allison Atkinson Phillips, Newcastle University's first lecturer in public history, Duncan Swainsbury, who graduated from here in economics and business management and who's the founder of Bounce Back Food, and Masatano Ciccione, who has an MSc in e-business from Newcastle University and is the founder of Sparable. I'll tell you a little bit more about each before they speak. And after each panelist has spoken, we'll turn to you, our online audience, for the live Q&A. We very much welcome questions to our panel, and you can submit these in the Q&A function below. If you would like a particular panelist to answer your question, please say so in your question. Otherwise, we'll open it up for the entire panel. Now, this program of activity continues until the 9th of October this year, and we hope you can join us for future events, including our annual meeting of convocation, where you can hear from Vice Chancellor and President Chris Day. This will be followed by our convocation lecture, where you can join Reverend Professor Keith McGee as he explores the value of shared experiences going beyond the hashtags to shape brighter futures across the globe and bring about meaningful change. This live panel discussion is being recorded and we'll share it after the Alumni Day of Action and when we will include closed captions at that point. And if you'd like to find out more about this research, the work and activity of our panel members today, we'll circulate information afterwards. Or if you're watching on demand, we'll include the relevant links in the description tab. So I'm delighted now to introduce Dr. Allison Atkinson Phillips lecturer in public history at Newcastle University. She started life here in the Northeast and then came back in 2018 from Australia, where she worked in communications, obtained a PhD at the Australian Centre for Public History at the University of Technology, Sydney, and taught at Murdoch University. She led Newcastle University's project on food bank histories, which was a collaboration between the Oral History Collective Northern Cultural Projects and Newcastle West End Food Bank, exploring the interconnected lives behind the Newcastle West End Food Bank. We'll hear more now about that project from Dr. Atkinson Phillips. Over to you, Alison. Thanks, Anya. And, um... On the first slide. I want to start just by thanking uh, the organising team uh, for the chance to talk about this issue. Food poverty is such an important issue in the UK and really food is just a lens, although it's a really helpful lens for looking at the wider issue of poverty in this country. Um, as Anya said, this is a collaborative project and um, I would normally be co-presenting with my collaborator, Sylvie Fish from Northern Cultural Projects. So I just wanna acknowledge her work uh, um, and also Jack Hepworth, another member of the Oral History Collective who um, were also interviewers for this work. Next slide, please. So the rising need for food banks in the UK has been the subject of a substantial body of research, 
that's demonstrated that the UK social security provision is inadequate, that welfare reforms over the past decade have ne negatively impacted on some of the most vulnerable in our society, especially people with disabilities and single parent families, and that people who need food aid have usually experienced a financial or life shock that's almost always accompanied by chronic underlying poverty. Uh, and a recent State of Hunger report in 2020, 2021 found that the average household income of people uh, getting referrals to food banks was 13% of the national average income. There's also a strong link between mental health mental ill health and poverty. Uh, so I've included a couple of links on that slide. And one place that you might want to go to find out more is the Evidence and Network on UK Household Food Insecurity or Enough blog site. Um, next slide, please. So in amongst all of this research, what's our contribution? Um, as I've said, this is a collaborative project. Um, and one of the collaborators is the Newcastle West End Food Bank, which started in 2013 and became kind of famous through the film I, Daniel Blake. When we started our project in 2018, they operated three sites and they now have six across Newcastle. Until the pandemic hit in March 2020, people could not only access a food parcel, but they could go to the food bank for advice and support. The Lilia Centre in Benwell used to serve a two-course meal every Tuesday and Wednesday. I, Daniel Blake, was also the inspiration for the NUFC Fans Food Bank Supporter Group. And if you're from Newcastle and a football fan, you've probably seen them at their match day collections. So my colleague, Sylvie, who's in the photograph with me here, uh, she's the director of Northern Cultural Project and also a member of the Oral History Collective. And she was approached by the Fans Food Bank supporters to see if she could do anything to help them combat the stigma of food poverty in our community. And that was really our primary aim when we started this project. So in 2018, we spent a lot of time hanging out at the Lilia Centre in Benwell, washing dishes, eating delicious meals and interviewing people. And along with Jack, Jack Hepworth, another member of the collective, we interviewed 16 clients and 15 volunteers and three NUFC fans, food bank supporters. But we also had a lot of really informal conversations as we were sort of hanging out and that also uh, informed our research and our findings. One of the really important things about oral history as a research method is that it gives freedom to the people who participate in the research. They decide how they want to tell their stories and the ways they're comfortable for their story to be shared. An oral history approach also meant we could explore with people the history of food poverty and their experience of using a food bank. So our interview questions were grouped around three general themes of past, present and hopes for the future. All the interviews with clients were at the Lilia Centre, which predominantly catered for long-term clients. And that does mean that the people we spoke to were usually experiencing chronic poverty rather than a temporary crisis. And in 2019, we ran a series of food reminiscence workshops that resulted in the Canny Cooks recipe book you can see on the screen. And the recipes in that book were collected from the clients as a way of countering the idea that people need food banks because they can't budget or don't cook. We also held a feedback workshop where our findings were presented back to the people we interviewed. In 2020, we re-interviewed 10 of the participants in longer life history interview, and we talked about their memories of childhood and family and stories that have been passed down to them. The main focus of those follow-up interviews was to explore how life shocks events were dealt with in the past, because life shock events have always happened. So why all of a sudden in the last 10 years do we need food banks? While recognising the stigma and shame associated with food poverty, We've supported interviewees who choose to put their names to their stories, and we've valued their agency in this process. Since the pandemic hit, a lot of things have changed. Social distancing meant the kitchen closed and serving hot meals was no longer possible. A lot of the clients and volunteers had to shield, and the service changed to issuing parcels at the door and sometimes doing deliveries as well. But the underlying reasons why people needed to access 
food banks didn't change. In fact, if anything, the pandemic made them more visible than ever. Next slide, please. Some of the clients we met had led a precarious existence for most of their lives. Without a strong safety net, difficult life events, such as a bereavement or a job loss or health issues easily triggered a crisis and offered a prolonged period of hardship. In our interviews, health problems were central to the loss of opportunity and often of autonomy. Some 60% of the clients that we talked to had experienced some form of ill health, mental or physical, and that's consistent with statistics for larger studies. Here are just two examples, both younger people. First of all, Lee, he was devastated by the sudden loss of his partner. He lost his job and had to learn how to navigate the benefit system as a single dad. When we first spoke to him, he'd been waiting 12 weeks for his first universal credit payment. Next slide, please. And this is a story from Kay. In her 20s, she began her testimony by explaining the turning point in her working life when she'd had an accident that led to her losing her job. As a single mum, the system didn't support her to retrain for work that she was physically able to do, and she found herself stuck in poverty. She wanted to work, but the advice she got from the job seeker, the job centre people, was that it would be better for her to stay on income support. Next slide, please. One of the things our interview showed us was the internalised stigma about food bank use, even within the clients and volunteer groups themselves. Some clients worked hard to distinguish themselves from those other people who wrought the system. And in this, we hear echoes of narratives about the deserving and undeserving poor that date back to the Victorian era. Before the pandemic, we were talking about how to use the interviews to interrupt this narrative, but COVID's made that much harder in some ways, although perhaps easier in others. In the, in the sense that more people have actually experienced what it's like to go through a crisis. I'm not saying that's a good thing. But on the plus side, some of the volunteers told us that getting involved in the food bank had made them realise that it's okay to ask for help when you need it. Next slide, please. A lot of the volunteers expressed some ambivalence about the relationship between the local food bank and the umbrella organisation, the church, the, the Trussell Trust, which is a Church of England charity with some well-publicised rules that constrict the way food, um, food parcels are provided. Some volunteers shared their strategies to bend or break the rules. In practice, the divide between the volunteers and the clients is pretty porous in the sense that often, like the food bank recipients, volunteers found themselves at the food bank as a result of a life shock. Often they had experienced ill health or disability, and in some cases they were recipients of the food aid now or in the past. So this is the example of Cathy. Um, she was one of the instigators of the food bank, alongside Tim, who was the then minister of the Venerable Bede Church in Benwell. And she'd heard about food banks down south and knew that there was a need here in the northeast. So later on, a paid CEO was appointed to run the charity, but Cathy continued to be involved. She was physically constrained, but she trained with citizens' advice so she would be able to give better advice to food bank visitors. And that was how she saw her role. Cathy's motivation comes out of her own long-term experience of poverty and disability. She talked about her difficult childhood and the sense of shock when she realised that she was one of the poor for the first time. We also talked about how she relates to the people who come to the food bank, and this is what she said. You look down on me if you have sympathy. You empathise because you go, well, blood, that's not me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, but I'm going to try my best to get you out of that situation. You have to empathise with people. You know what I mean? We have all these different things wrong with. Every single person's got something wrong with them. Everybody. Some are lucky, some are not. You need to be able to see, I can help as far as I can go. But then it's up to you. Mm -hmm. That's empathy. 
Next slide, please. So these are really important ideals, but what do they mean in practice? Um, this is what Dean says it feels like. You come, you get your three days worth of food, but they always give you the extra. Wherever, if you go to the bead or you come to here, there's always that little bit extra that comes in and you're free to take enough what you need. And this stuff are amazing. They really are, they look after you. If you've got any issues, whether you're feeling poorly, you just want to go and have a little chat to someone, shoulder to cry on, anything, the staff are there. There's just no, you don't have to make a meeting or anything like you do with the job centre if you want to speak to someone. There's always someone in the food bank that will sit with you and you can just literally offload as much as you like and the support's there. It's actually better at the food bank for the support than it is actually going to see the job centre because the job centre, they don't listen. Food bank staff do. They literally take everything because they see so many people over the week with the same issues. They support you far, far more. So that's why, unfortunately, I'm a regular now for about a year and a half, close to two years now for the food bank and... You never get questioned, you never get told you've been coming here too long. You can come here as long as you like. And they will always welcome you. There's a cup of tea. Everything is just there. Next slide, please. You come, you get your three. So, as I said earlier on, um, one of the things we wanted to think about was what can we contribute to this conversation as historians? So, in the interviews we contact conducted in early 2020. We asked 10 long-term clients and volunteers about times in the past when life was hard for themselves or their parents or grandparents. We wanted to know how people coped in the past and what's different now. We heard stories about neighbours rallying around, in particular, for example, when Shirley's mother had to go to the hospital for an operation, but also in more everyday ways, passing down clothing or sharing food. And there's a little quote on the screen there about a common story of neighbours sharing coal back in mining days. People remembered neighbours providing ad hoc childcare when their mother had to work. Or, and Janet could list a long list of aunties who lived in the same block of flats and helped her mum out when times were hard. As Kath said when she looked back, she didn't remember the poverty. What she remembered was that people cared. Now you might think that's a bit of a rose-coloured way of thinking about the past and maybe things are different now. Um, next slide, please. There's certainly a dominant narrative that says that we've lost that sense of community, but this is what James had to say. My father had a car. He got a car and, of course, he knew somebody across the road called George Bainbridge. So they used to mend the cars. You could then, you could come and, you know, mend your own car, repair the bodywork and that sort of thing and inspect it. You know, you could then. <laughs> but, uh, and we used to go down the road and had to dig people's gardens, the back gardens over for them, or clear them, you know just people down the road but um so they did all that for free well yeah but i mean it's just you know it's just what people did now you know i just uh, you want to go down and clear this garden for, for Miss, Miss that so and so you know or hope the road <clears throat> mm. well, that's all changed hasn't it no i don't no. think it has to be honest I, I really don't think it has. I think it's um, people still. I've, I've heard people here helping out each other in the, in the food bank, you know, doing favours for each other. I think it's. I don't think it's really changed, to be honest. We had quite a lot of other small mentions that substantiate what James had to say. For, so, for example, Jim goes every week to do housework with his ex-partner who's disabled. Denise carries dog treats to give to rough sleepers who have pets. Keith's it's too old to take on heavy digging at the food bank garden, but shares his expertise with younger volunteers. And I've heard that he continued to do that even during lockdown. Next slide, please. So we were just finishing the last round of interviews when lockdown hit. And 
what we saw then also substantiated that idea that the community is still there. We saw thousands of ordinary people stepping up to help their neighbours who had to shield, volunteering at their local food bank, joining more informal mutual aid groups or just connecting with the people on their street. Oral History Collective have also been conducting interviews with these mutual aid volunteers and we'll be co-hosting a workshop on that topic later in the month if you want to get information about that. Our Food Bank History interviewees remind us that such kindness is not new, but it does need space to grow. We think neighbourly acts and neighbourly care and acts of solidarity are both inspiring and necessary, but tackling food poverty requires a fundamental recognition that people have the right to live in dignity and fundamental changes to the UK's welfare system. So if you'd like to hear or read more about our interviews, here are some links, and I'd really encourage you to join the hashtag Keeps a Lifeline campaign, asking your local MP to keep the £20 uplift to universal credit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. That was fascinating and moving, and I'm sure we'll have questions and discussion on that wonderful presentation later. May I now introduce with great pleasure, Duncan Swansbury, the founder of Bounce Back Food CIC, a nationwide community cookery school that is fighting food poverty in multiple ways. Duncan graduated in 2013 from Newcastle University with a BA in economics and business management. While a student here, he volunteered in the People's Kitchen and he later took the idea of buy one, give one to set up his social enterprise company. Since then, Bounce Back have delivered tens of thousands of meals and taught more than 3,000 people to cook. And they're now launching their third uh, fundraising cookbook. You can see details on how to attend that launch in Newcastle in October later in Duncan's presentation. So Duncan, over to you. Thank you very much, Anya. And thanks to everyone for joining this uh, session this evening. And very excited to tell you about how I set up and have grown Bounce Back Food CIC uh, since um, initially going to visit and volunteering at the People's Kitchen um, and then moving down to Manchester uh, where I volunteered at Fair Share Greater Manchester. Uh, so next slide please. Um, so as a nationwide community cookery school seven years on we're now tackling food poverty in a number of different ways um, and there's lots of opportunities for people to get involved as we replicate our cookery school model um, that I started in Salford and then grew to support people predominantly in the Northwest prior to COVID um, hitting. So on the next slide, you'll, um, you'll see how right at the start, um, I was very much inspired by Tom's, the shoe brand, who for every pair of shoes that you buy, they, they donate a, a pair to a child in a developing country who often has to walk quite a considerable distance to and from their school. And I thought there was something quite powerful about that model in the way that as a consumer, you can buy a product and also then give one as well. And my time volunteering at Fair Share Greater Manchester um, shocked me actually, uh, the fact that over 10,000 people every single week were relying on the, uh, the food bank um, was just outrageous. And obviously that was just one food bank for, in Manchester. But also as a volunteer, I noticed that a lot of time was being wasted sorting between food that was eligible and not eligible to be distributed. For instance, certain foods might be past their use by date and, and therefore not safe. So what I decided to do was to initially set up a market stall that sold a range of pasta, rice, tin food, uh, soup and cereal, that kind of thing. And for every item that was sold, the same one was then given to the nearest food bank. Um, and that represented a way of ensuring that the consumer was buying a product for themselves and also donating the same one, um, which was really nice in, in that sense of having parity uh, with, the, um, with the purchase that was being made. Um, and from there, uh, if you go to the next slide, thanks. Um, I then realised as well that as well as um, donating really good nutritious items of food to food banks, it would be vitally important to teach people how to cook too. And one of the things pre-pandemic, uh, which we really pioneered in and around Manchester, was extending that buy one, give one model to the cookery courses uh, that we ran in a variety of locations in, in the northwest. And essentially, when you bought a ticket to one of our cookery workshops, 
um, a free place was given to someone who was referred to us from a food bank or one of our partner charities. And on our cookery courses, we'd therefore have people from all parts of the community coming together and learning to cook um, and, and sharing that sense of community, which I'm delighted to say we're able to now begin to restart our in-person cooking courses. Um, but as well as that, in order to properly tackle food poverty, I realised that our delivery teams would also have to continue to do the food bank drives to generate really good items of food to be donated. We'd also have to employ a chef and, and work with volunteers to ensure that we could deliver catering services. Um, during COVID-19, that, that turned into community meal drives to make sure that we were feeding vulnerable people and also to deliver learning programmes and cookery workshops because as a community cookery school, we have to ensure that everyone is able to access um, the offer of our delivery teams in the different locations. Uh, next slide, please. And so in the first five years um, of, of Bounce Back Food, we delivered all of those things in the Northwest, supporting food bank users. Uh, we also developed cookery courses specifically for stroke survivors using adaptable kitchen equipment to ensure that they could take part in sessions. Um, we partnered with an increasing number of, of charities, including carers charities, um, and began to teach more and more people how to cook. And I think the next few slides will perhaps detail some of the, the sort of social impact uh, milestones that our team in the Northwest had hit. So, so far we've, we've taught over 3000 people how to cook predominantly in person, uh, but the food bank drive, which is how the organization began has secured over 10,000 items of food donated to food banks in the Northwest. And with our community meal drives and catering services, uh, we've now uh, generated over 80,000 hot, nutritious meals. And I think when COVID hit, obviously it was a shock to everyone. But from my perspective, it was a question of, OK, well, we have this community cookery school model in, in and around Manchester. How can we now replicate our model to tackle food poverty across the UK? And how can we become a nationwide community cookery school? So what we did was to sort of lean into the challenges that COVID threw us. And um, we're now in the process of replicating our community cookery school model in, in all of the locations that you can see there. I'm, I'm delighted to say that in November, our London team will launch um, and next year, hopefully Sheffield and Liverpool as well. And, and in other locations, we're um, building a team of volunteers initially, um, but we do hope to expand and ensure that we have a delivery team of people in every single large city of the UK so that we can tackle food poverty proactively uh, nationwide. So that's that's where we're at currently. And just um, to talk about some of the, the other things that we're doing, and I've referred to the in-person uh, support that our delivery teams can provide. Actually, just going back to the reference to the carers charity that we, we worked with in Manchester back in the early days, one of the problems that would uh, often occur would be that we would deliver a cooking workshop, let's say on a Tuesday afternoon, two till four o'clock. Um, and that would be wonderful for the 16 people which we could support on that afternoon who were free. But in the case of Manchester Carers Network, for instance, uh, they have over 5,000 carers unpaid who they support. And I was very much aware that we had to develop something that could reach people at scale. Um, and so about three years ago, we started to work on an online version of our community cookery school. Um, and that's turned into our cooking and nutrition portal, which has hundreds of recipes, which we've developed and taught over the years, cooking tips, nutrition advice, um, an interactive meal planner, which interestingly was the most used feature uh, during COVID in the various lockdowns. And the online aspect of our nationwide community cookery school means that we can now reach a greater number of people, but crucially, in my opinion, provide a very solid offer, both in person and also online as well. One of the other big challenges, I suppose, um, in terms of running a social enterprise and developing this model so that we can tackle food poverty across the UK is the issue of sustainability. So how can we ensure that by 2024, which will be our 10 year anniversary, that we do have a team in every single location that can provide the vitally important in-person support and also have that online offer as well to make sure we're reaching as many people as possible. And so in terms of sustainability, one of the things which we've done is given people the option to become a member um, of our community cookery school um, and to pay for access to the recipes and the content that I referred to there. That's one of the things which we've, um, we've got as an option on the website if you're interested in what we're doing and how we're hoping to grow. Um, I think on the next slide, it details some of the other things that we've done over the years as well. So this, um, 
this is secret dishes from around the world the very first cookbook which we um which we launched in 2019 I mentioned the buy one, give one cookery courses uh, and the, the 12 people in attendance, six people who paid, six people who came along for free. And, and actually we branded those cookery courses as secret dishes from around the world. The participants wouldn't know what cuisine they were going to learn until they arrived at the kitchen. And that was the thing that united people on the evening. And over the years, we developed so many different sessions, so many different recipes. We, we began to publish the fundraising cookbooks. I think that's the second one pictured there. And, and there's all three. The third one comes out on the 1st of October. Uh, we partnered with 20 arts charities and social enterprises in the 20 locations where we're expanding our model and um, the second book we partnered with 20 northwest artists and the first book was all illustrated by um, one manchester-based artist called libby elements so the fundraising cookbooks are a way in which uh, as a consumer beyond buying a bag of pasta or buying a tin of tomatoes um, you know by buying a gift if, if you like that gives twice this is one of the ways which we're aiming to to grow become more sustainable um, and therefore most importantly to support a greater number of people um i think there's a, a couple of slides remaining and and essentially yeah there's so many ways in which people can help the, the development of our organization i've mentioned the membership the cookbooks uh, volunteers in, in all kinds of different capacities we're actively looking to grow teams in different locations please do get in touch um there's also things like the cookery courses that we run running online um gift vouchers all kinds of things please do um check out our social media i think the final slide has has details of that and um and yeah thank you so much for listening to the story of bounce back food and hopefully see you at one of our events soon Thank you very much, Duncan. And so we've now heard about four cookbooks, the three secret cookbooks and the canny cook book from Allison. And it's a very exciting enterprise and I'm sure we'll want to talk about that more in the Q&A session. So please do send your questions in. I'm delighted now to introduce our third and final speaker, Masatano Sichone. Originally from Zambia, Masatano graduated in 2017 from Newcastle University with an MSc in e-business information systems. When he arrived, he was surprised to find that food poverty was a problem in the UK, and he volunteered with the Newcastle West End Food Bank. Then, supported by Newcastle's startup initiative, he developed an innovative app, Sparable, which enables food banks to aggregate donations from individuals to buy food in bulk. You can see the links to Sparable here um, on the um, on the web page. And I have to say, on a personal note, I found the app very easy to use, and it feels very rewarding too. For this app, Masitano was recently named a top 100 change maker 2020, defeating poverty by the big issue. So over to you now, Masitano. Thank you, Anya. And uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak here today. And yep, thanks for everybody for coming and joining in. So I'm the founder of an app called Sparable. Um, I think maybe it's better I start with um, my personal views on the matter. So like, I believe social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights, as well as opportunities. The right to food is one of those. It's in fact, it's the most basic human right. It was set out by the, by the United Nations International Convention for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which the UK government adopted or ratified in 1976. The rise of food banks, Currently, they think there's over 1,200 food banks in the UK and other charitable providers in the food space. It's alarming. They're assuming an increasingly significant role in the fulfillment of the right to food, which should really be a government obligation. Uh, food banks shouldn't need to exist, but I'm not naive to the fact that they are here and they're doing a great job. They're redistributing thousands and thousands of food uh, parcels to vulnerable people as well as signposting them to where they can get help for the underlying issues that are, that are putting them in these situations. West End Food Bank is just one of them. I, I think they, they started to operate in 2013 and they've been providing food parcels. I think at the time I joined, I, I heard that they were doing about 30,000 people per year, providing parcels for about 30,000 people per year. So my journey with them started in December, 2018. Um, just before that, I was doing a bit of research um, for a project in university. And then I discovered um, the numbers on food poverty here. 
and they really did shock me. So after I submitted my dissertation, while I was waiting, hanging around for graduation, I decided to look up a food bank. And the closest one to me was Western Food Bank. So I walked in there and asked if I could volunteer to see firsthand some of the issues that I read about in my research. Um, so I worked there for some time in the warehouse, packing parcels to, re to, re to redistribute. I think Duncan mentioned earlier about the uh, sorting out parcels by, by, by use by dates and things like that. So this is what you would do. You'd sort out all the incoming donations and then also pack them into new packs to distribute out. Uh, it was there where I saw a funny thing. For me, it was funny in that we had pasta on the shelves, a lot of pasta, but every day pasta kept coming in, for example. And then I was like, surely in this age where people have got um, online shopping, next day delivery, there must be an easier way to tell a donor exactly what we need rather than get stuff that we don't need that might possibly not get used up by its use by date. So um, with my background in tech software development, I spoke to the chief executive, John McCory at the time there. Uh, he still is actually. And then he said, uh, he agreed that um, I could pilot something with their donors. So I went back to Newcastle University, ex expressed what I'm trying to do. And I got a lot of support from the startup team there, um, mentorship as well. And by March, I started to work on this project. Uh, August 2018, we finally launched the app to Newcastle West End uh, supporters. And by November that year, we had about 500 people that had installed our app and were helping the food bank. It was really shocking for me. I mean, uh, Anya, you mentioned there, I, I came to the UK in 2016 to study a master's here at Newcastle University. I had no idea that um, food poverty was an issue here in the UK. So having that experience of volunteering and seeing um, what it was all about was just uh, felt really good to know, uh, to be able to help in, and, and yes, and find out more about it. So by January 2020, more food banks started to approach us, not just around Newcastle, but even outside Newcastle. So we started to let them on. Um, we didn't expect that at all. We thought we were building an app for West End Food Bank, and uh, I didn't really anticipate that there was going to be a large demand for it. Uh, what we really didn't expect was COVID-19, the pandemic, I mean. Uh, Food banks across the country recorded a large increase in users, but thankfully as well, the donors responded, the public responded. I think we at Sparable saw a 625% increase in donations during the first three months of COVID from the previous months since we launched the app. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just talk about a little bit about the app itself. What the app allows food banks to do is let the public know exactly what they're looking for by presenting a list of of those products, we're calling this a wish list. A user would then purchase those asked for items in the app for delivery directly to the food bank. In the background, Sparable aggregates um, these orders made in the app, it searches for the best prices, sales, and discounts on large volume purchases, and places these orders with a distributor or multiple distributors to deliver right to the food banks. As of today, we're working with about 30 food banks across the UK, all the way from Kent up to Glasgow. We have about 4,000 people that have downloaded our app to help a food bank. Around 1,000 of those are active users purchasing food for food banks on a recurring basis. Our biggest impact for food banks, I believe, is the benefit from bulk buying. Because we're aggregating the orders and purchasing in bulk volume, we're achieving around 25 to 30% more food than if those donors that use the app had gone into a supermarket themselves and made the purchase there. The food is delivered free of charge, of course, straight to the food bank's doorstep. And as of today, the food banks have gotten exactly what they need. About 35,000 kilograms of food has been purchased through our app and delivered. Not just what donors want to give, but exactly what the food banks needed at the time or whatever they asked for at the time. Um, other ways you could fight um, hunger. Uh, I know obviously just, just buying food and providing food is, is, is not the solution, but we feel at least making a food bank more efficient in what they're doing currently is a, is a step forward. Other ways you could help a food bank is to volunteer. Something that we tried to do last year, but the, 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 the pandemic stopped us in our tracks in getting that all sorted. 
So it's something that we're looking at improving in the app, volunteering feature in the app. Also, um, uh, feel free to try out the app if you can. Um, it's on the App Store and the Play Store. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masatano. We've heard such fascinating talks and your app is, is really a wonderful thing, Masatano. We're now open for questions. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions of the panelists as a whole or individual panelists, please do put them in the Q&A function. Um, I'd like to start off by asking Masatano a, a little bit more about your reaction to finding food poverty here in the UK where you might not have expected it. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe how food poverty differs in the UK from elsewhere, perhaps if you know what it is like in Zambia, if, if you could make that comparison or with other countries, do you think that our food poverty um, is, is, is particular to this country or um, more typical of what we find elsewhere? I think food poverty is generally the term is the same everywhere. It's a worldwide problem. It's the inability of individuals or households to secure adequate or, nutri or an adequate or, nu or nutritious diet, or simply put, not having enough money to buy sufficient nutritious food. So that in itself is a global thing. It's going to be the same everywhere. I think what's different is what drives people what drives people into food poverty i think that's what's different um mm -hmm. let's let's look at the geographic first of all the uk i think has a population of about 66 million whereas zambia is much much smaller we've got about 17 million i read somewhere that 8.7 million people in the uk are struggling to put food on the table i think the big difference is one of the one of the differences is um I think 80 plus percent of people in the UK live in urban areas, where back in Zambia, I think it's 40% live in urban areas, where 60 are in rural areas. With the back home in Zambia, in rural areas, a lot of the people there are doing subsistence farming. So that's growing crops or raising livestock for themselves, as well as maybe a little bit extra for sale. So it's different from somebody living in an urban area, the, the experience of food poverty, they're able to produce something and enough to to eat maybe not the most nutritious meals but they'll have something to eat where if you're in an urban situation you you don't have that luxury of having a piece of land to do your own farming or keep some livestock so yeah that's one of the big differences i also feel um here that some of the drivers to the uk here are benefits delays inadequacy gaps and reductions in benefits i think uh in zambia we don't even have a benefit system so there's nothing like that. There's no government support um, in that regard. I think the problems we have are more uh, poor harvests, um, crop failures, uh, drought. Those are the things that would lead people to get into poverty. But some of them are the same as well, like changing life circumstances, um, evictions, divorce, um, illness. Those are things that are present on all, both here and there. So it, it just depends on, it's a difficult one, but it just depends on personal circumstances, I think. Thank you. That was really an illuminating answer. Thank you very much. Um, we, uh, we've had a question come in, uh, which I can say really any of you could take. Um, what do food banks most need, food or money? I don't know if Duncan or Alison, if either of you would like to take that, that one. Duncan. Yeah, I mean, from from what we've experienced over the years, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I also think it's about ensuring that from an individual's perspective, that there's ongoing support that's also provided as well as the offer of food. And even the offer of food is something that um, that varies um, from food bank to food bank. Um, so anything that can help to support food banks with ensuring that they can have a, a regular supply of food or a, um, a more consistent supply of food such as Masatana's fantastic app um, can support food banks on, on 
on, on in both of those two ways, I think. But from from my perspective, I'd say that it all kind of varies based on the requirements of the individual. And there's a myriad of different reasons as to why someone may be receiving support from a food bank. Um, that makes me think of a question that came to my mind when Alison was speaking, and particularly when we heard from Dean, your food bank client. What it sounded, what it made me think of was the fact that having a meal with someone isn't just eating with someone, it's also making a connection with someone. You know, it's things that families do together, it's things that friends do together, and it gives you um, a way to develop and, you know, sink into a relationship with someone. And what Dean seemed to be saying was that was one of the big things that the food bank gave him. I don't know if you have thoughts about that and maybe the importance of volunteers then to be able to provide that as well as the food. Yeah, I think that's um, a really important thing that we have seen happening at the Western Food Bank and why it's really, you know, been so hard, I think, when lockdown hit and they weren't able to offer that kind of wider um, community anymore. Um, you know, it's it's obviously if people don't have enough food, that's, I mean, in some ways food poverty is like the canary in the coal mine, right? It's like it's it's the 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 food is is often the very last thing that people can cut when they've tried to budget in every other way. And so obviously that's a really fundamental need, as Ms. Mastano said, and you have to provide that. But beyond that, a lot of the reasons that people end up in the bank is because they don't have a wider network of support. And, um, you know, some of us, if we lost our job tomorrow, we've got people who were able to actually step in and be that safety net for us, even if the state isn't going to do that. Um, other people don't have that. And I think, um, yeah, things like building community, just having someone to sit with and spend, even if you don't want to talk to them, just being in a room with other people. I think the last 18 months have taught us all how important that is. Um, so, yeah, I think all of those other things are really important. And I, I know that the Western Food Bank and I'm sure lots of other places around the country are trying to think about what they can do now that things are starting to open up again to go back to supporting people in other ways. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. That um, makes a lot of sense. Um, Raquel asks, What's the relationship between food waste and food poverty? And is there any way to find solutions that aid both problems? Don't know whether any of you- Can I have a go at answering that? Yes, um, please. I think it's a really tricky one because I think, um, you know, both Duncan and Masatano are trying to find solutions um, to the problem of food waste in a way and, um, and you know, the mechanics of how you get people food. Um, but also, as Masatano said earlier, like um, that's not the only solution. And if we try and focus too much on the technical fixes, then um, we sometimes I think risk um, missing the wider problem. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I think, um, I think both of those problems need to be addressed, but I don't think that you can fix one with the other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alison. We have a question from Peter for, for Duncan. Um, oh, and it's just gone away because I think Duncan has typed in an answer. And so <laughs> <laughs> I've lost the question and the answer. No, it, it was... I, mean, I don't know if you want to um elaborate on both question I mean, and answer because i can't read it to you now because it's no longer in my <laughs> i do apologize but no it was just it was in terms of which of the uh, initiatives that we're doing the the cookery courses and the the cookbooks that kind of things have, have been most effective and i just mentioned in the answer that one of the things that's been really powerful is the extension of the buy one give one model to the cookery workshops that with that ticketing model, bring people together from all parts of the community and spark conversations on an evening through food um, with people that, that yeah, is, is really, really powerful. I was just saying that that'll be a key feature of the delivery teams that we have in different locations. It's very important from, from my perspective to ensure that it is a combination of the in-person events and also the online offer. Um, and 
uh, yeah, one thing which we've done during COVID is is run the equivalent course online as a cook along, um, and that's helped us to connect kitchens across the UK. So someone in Glasgow might buy a ticket, and that might fund a free place for someone who's referred to us from a charity in Bristol. Um, and so going forwards, that's a good example in, uh, in my view of something that we should continue to do because that's that's equally quite special, uh, the online version, but not accessible to everyone. And so it, it has to be a combination of the two uh, going forwards. Mm -hmm. So that's one way in which tech is very important, as you've all shown, really, in, in helping to solve the problem. You need the good tech to make these kind of connections feasible across the, across the country for that solution. We have a question from Paul who says you've explained really well that this is a societal as well as a private challenge. What personal actions can people take to try to get out of this terrible situation? What policy changes could make a difference? What can the rest of us do to help? I think we're all feeling the need, the desire to help after these presentations. Do you know who would like to take that? I know you all have thoughts about it. Um, I feel like I've spoken a lot, but I'm happy to jump in. Um, so in terms of policy changes that I think would make a difference, I think uh, keeping the uplift in the universal credit permanently, that would be a good place to start. Um, and I would really encourage you to write to your local MP and let them know that you think that's a good idea. Um, you know, fundamentally, people don't have enough money to live on. Um, so that's tricky. Um, yeah, so I think educate yourself on the on the issue. There's a good report that came out uh, this year called the State of Hunger Report uh, that was um, commissioned by the Trussell Trust. There's lots of research out there. Um, you know, if, yeah, essentially, um, you know, all of the things that both Duncan and Masatano are doing uh, um, aimed at kind of helping to address this problem, but uh, I think the policy environment is is the the key issue, and that's why we've got more food banks now than we had ten years ago because of austerity. Thank you for that um, that view, Alison. I I just want to give everyone, each of you panelists, the opportunity to answer just one last question as we bring the evening to a close, just what one message would you want to give to everybody who's listening in? And we do have people listening from many countries around the world. What one message would you want to give them as to why eradicating food poverty is important? I'm happy to um, first and, and yeah, I think you know, one of the things is it's, I think it's so easy to ignore something like this. Um, one of the things we've encountered uh, in around Manchester is that people are shocked, you know, when they find out the statistics to do with this particular challenge. Um, and so, as Alison's mentioned, there's, um, there's reports that are released, um, there's data out there, please just have conversations with people, make people aware of this challenge um, and this problem, because you know, it's, it's very easy for people to just ignore this and do nothing. But in fact, there's there's many, many things that people can do. Um, and, and these conversations, events such as this one are vitally important at, at raising awareness and then encouraging people to be part of the solution. Um, and also a recognition that there's not just one solution, that it's going to take collaboration, partnerships, multiple ideas in order to tackle something as big as food poverty because of the scale of the issue uh, within our country and globally as well. Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. And I just want to re reiterate that your company, your enterprise, social enterprise company is doing multiple things, which I can read as arising from your belief that there are multiple ways to tackle this very important problem and teaching people how to cook is one very, very important um, solution. Masatano, would you like to um, say what your message is about the importance of eradicating food poverty? 
like I said earlier, it's just it's a it's a basic human right that that, that everybody needs. That governments across the world need to adopt what the UN laid out, and it just we need to get involved basically if we all get involved somehow it can be through campaigns it can be through volunteering it can be through donating but you're doing this to help you're doing this to help not just um you're not, you're doing this to help other people get out of situations that may not be their fault that they're in there's a lot of stigma i think um that we've discussed in this call that people have and if you put that aside and just think of it as it's a basic human right that everybody needs to have a right to food. And if you can, in some way, get involved and help fundraise, volunteer, campaign, any, any, anything that you can do to help would be great. Thank you. I think that's a real call to action. Thank you very much, Masitano. Alison, would you like to? Um, so I'm going to answer a little bit differently. I think my final thing would be to say that we, um, you know, when we talk about these kind of issues, often talk about it as if food poverty is stuff that happens to other people. But we know it can happen to all sorts of different people. And so if you're someone who is experiencing um, food poverty yourself, don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, often people come to the food bank when they're like really, really, things have gotten desperate and, um, you know, speak up, talk about the issues, um, don't feel ashamed. Thank you. That That is very important. It can be right there under your nose and you not see it. And it's, it's important that we recognise that and do as much as we can in as many ways as we can. And you've all given us real insight into the things that can be done when you um, use the imagination and the skills and put in the hard work that all of you wonderful people coming out of the Newcastle University community um, are able to do. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this evening. And just to repeat that you can follow the links that um, appeared in the presentations to hear more about the projects about our speakers and the work that they and others and Newcastle is doing to alleviate food poverty. And also have a look at our website and the pages of the people you've heard from tonight to hear about other Newcastle research that aims to solve global problems and about our aim to invent solutions from engineering to medicine to social policy. And please, I must say, do join us for our future events in this series of the Alumni Day of Action for Social Justice 2021. Thank you again for joining us and good night, everyone.